production of immense possibilities is also made possible by a major grant from the Whole Systems Foundation, advancing well-designed projects that conserve resources and reduce waste and chemical pollution, as well as grants from the Community Foundation of Sonoma County, Elizabeth York, Herb and Deborah Rothschild, Ann Johnson, as well as support from these generous businesses and individuals. These are entirely used to water our garden, um, and it's 100 percent rainwater. So I'll kind of go through what I did here and, and give you all an idea. I think the last five to ten years, if that's any indication, I think we're going to see uh, you know, these things be really almost commonplace. And water is a very useful tool for this, is getting kids to think in uh, about systems in a large way and recognizing that they can be part of the solution, not feeling just a kind of despair or apathy about all the problems that they are going to face, but that they can really come up with ways to make things better. Dad, when I was a kid, would make sure that I really rolled around and fully enjoyed it before I could come back in. <laughs> Welcome to our weekly visit with people who are creating immense possibilities for healthier communities and solutions to all kinds of challenges. Healthy communities around the world are rediscovering and refining an old practice that offers massive amounts of water. High quality water, badly needed water, free water. What India is promoting is coming a little more slowly to affluent countries, but as water's precious value gets more and more obvious, rainwater harvesting is coming on strong. There's a national organization, the American Rainwater Catchment System Association, or ARCSA, who promotes it. And our first guest tonight is one of its regional representatives, Jason Garvey, who's the owner of Portland Purple Water and on the line with us from Portland. Jason, welcome to Immense Possibilities. It's really good to have you here. Hi, thanks, Jeff. Appreciate it. There are several components to what we call rainwater harvest or this whole field. Besides water catchment, capturing it off of roofs, what are the others? Well, the water, rainwater harvesting as a whole has two basic subdivisions. Uh, you have active rainwater harvesting and then you have passive rainwater harvesting. Uh, active rain rainwater harvesting are the kinds of systems that we're most familiar with these days. Anything from barrels to cisterns where we're catching and storing water in a uh, in a confined place and then we're we're then going to apply it somewhat in some way. Uh, passive systems are, are very interesting. Uh, they fall under the low impact development category and what these are are ways to welcome rain on your property. A great example is uh, something called a rain garden where we take water 
and we bring it into a, a small infiltration pond and allow the, the water to soak in, into, the, uh, into the land, into the property. Jason, what's the first step for someone who either wants to be capturing more water off of their roofs or wants to be redirecting the water on their property and doesn't know anything about it? Uh, probably the best place, first of all, people can come to our website. We've got a whole uh, significant amount of information that they can uh, that they can see different types of ways to capture water and ways to apply it. Uh, but if they're looking for personal uh, hands-on experience, they, they might go to their soil and water conservation district. Uh, and everyone has one. Uh, we all live within them. And there's most likely going to be a rainwater harvesting uh, class or workshop that's coming to a place near them. That's, um, that's good. Yeah. Yeah, Jason, I appreciate your time very much. Thanks for being with us. We'll be in touch again. You're welcome, Jeff. Jason was talking about active systems, and especially in a drier part of the world than Portland, that can often mean rainwater catchment. And there is a fascinating ongoing conversation on YouTube of people who are inventing their own systems and putting them on to show how they're better than the other guys' systems. Let's look at one system right now. Uh, what you see here is a four barrel system. These are 55 gallon drums each for a total capacity of 220 gallons. And uh, got a hold of these through a uh, local Coca-Cola distributor here and uh, uh, charged five bucks a barrel, which is pretty good. They were all sprayed out and so forth. Uh, uh, there wasn't any syrup or anything left in there, but uh, I'm not using them for potable water anyway. These are mostly used, or these are entirely used to water our garden. Um, and it's 100% rainwater. There's your gutter right there. Gutter comes into a flexible downspout. There's a screen at the top of the downspout to kind of filter out any of the larger debris, leaves and branches and so forth. And the water runs down the downspout into a filter basket that I constructed out of uh, an old, or not an old, but a, a cheap plastic flower pot that I bought at Home Depot. Uh, cost me about a buck fifty. I just drilled a bunch of uh, holes in it to try to filter out some other debris that maybe the uh, uh, downspout filter may not have catched. Comes straight down from the gutter, empties into here fills up the tanks. This is my ball valve to allow water to escape, which I'll show right now. Got a pretty good head on it. And you can see right there, your rainwater. And it's muddy now. Anyway, uh, <clears throat> the nice thing about this manifold system, I hadn't seen anybody else uh, post this particular method. Uh, the nice thing about it is it ties all of the barrels in series and uh, with just one downspout you can fill up all these barrels and not have to worry about moving a hose between each barrel um, you know one of the basic physical principles of water is it always finds its own level so if you have everything connected in series no matter how much water is dropping into one tank it will eventually level itself out in all the other tanks that is one of dozens and dozens of systems you can find on YouTube on rainwater catchment. Of course, there are also more extensively engineered and sophisticated systems. Uh, we have with us a professional who works installing those and consulting on those. He is Ken Laidlaw. He, his company is called Valley Rain Harvesting here in Southern Oregon. Ken, it's great to have you here on Immense Possibilities. Thanks for having me, Jeff. What is going on generally with the interest in rainwater catchment? Well, I think nationally in the last five or ten years, we've really seen an explosion in rain harvesting uh, design and installation. And uh, I think part of that is due to uh, the fact that we live in a global environment. You can't really go on TV without actually seeing someone talk about a resource, whether it's oil or water or food. And so, you know, I think exposure to that really uh, drives people to be more aware of it. Have you thought about water that we're not using very well for a long time? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, specifically in Atlanta, we had a really bad drought uh, in 2005, 2006, 2007, and I was a landscape contractor at the time, and, uh, you know, I had to figure out how I was going to get water on my client's plants, uh, whether it was an existing job or a new job we were doing. And so, um, you know, it really became uh, a challenge for us to figure out, um, you know, how we were going to provide a resource for the plants and uh, still have the client's... Uh, uh, investment uh, kept safe. Give us an idea of what you've seen in the range of uh, what Jason was calling active harvesting from the simplest to kind of more sophisticated. Well, I mean, it really ranges from the basic 55 gallon 
drum uh, on up to an irrigation system which might uh, uh, include a 2,500 gallon cistern um, with a small pump uh, connected to an irrigation system uh, and then go to a potable system for a whole house uh, which is a little more complicated on up to commercial systems which can be fairly complex uh, with multiple pumps, multiple filters and uh, um, multiple tanks as well, and larger tanks. Now tanks are really the key in a drier climate, yes, like here in southern Oregon with limited rainfall, you can capture whatever you've got towards the end of spring, you go into the dry months, you use that up pretty quickly, and you're out of business unless you have larger storage. Yeah, and you know, here we have evaporation rates of 50%, so you know, having a pond, say, that uh, has captured rainwater over the winter, uh, you're going to lose half of that water to evaporation. So having a tank, having a cistern, you know, where you have zero evaporation rate uh, really conserves the resource for the rest of the summer. Do you have any words of caution for someone who might be watching this and ready to jump out and start experimenting with rainwater catchment? Yeah, absolutely. I would definitely check with uh, uh, the local and uh, local jurisdiction uh, first as far as uh, water department or, as Jason said, the uh, soil and water conservation uh, people uh, and check into local codes and restrictions and also state codes. I think those, uh, those things are there to keep us safe, really. Well, we're going to take a look now at the class of more passive rain harvesting. Video from Brad Lancaster, who is known nationally in the field as a good teacher, is a basic concept he'll show us. But what about the water we did lose, the water that ran off the general landscape? That all too often is the forgotten zone, okay? People only think of roofs and tanks, but we can store a much greater volume of water within the soil of the landscape if we set it up to hold on to, absorb, and use that water. Basically creating a sponge is what we need to do, a sponge of mulched and planted earthworks. So let's bring in those sponges. So. I just so happens I've got two sponges. But rather than being above ground, they would be more within the muffin tin basins. But this gets the general idea. So we will again rain on our little landscape. So here comes the rain. We'll rain enough to fill up the tanks. Whoa, we're already filled the tanks. That was quick. Okay, we lost a little bit of water to run off there but nowhere near as much water as we lost before. So we're now part of the community's flood control system, okay? Because we're keeping the bulk of the rain on site rather than wastefully sending it off site where it'll cause problems for others downstream. So I'm going to remove my house and replace it with a measuring cup. So let's look at what we caught. Again, 1,700 gallons from that cistern 1,700 gallons from this cistern for a total of 3,400 gallons of water that would have been lost before, free from the sky, no water bill for this one. And look at how much water that is. Okay, now remember that amount. Let's now add to that the water from the sponge, the water that we caught in the landscape. Okay, and then this sponge. Look at that. Four to ten times as much water is what we caught in the cisterns. And what is the cost of creating a sponge? Basically the price of a shovel. It's just changing the topography of your landscape so you've got level bottomed bowl like shapes that you then mulch with free organic matter. You plant it with vegetation, creating the living pump, and then the rain becomes your free, passive irrigator of that landscape. So Ken, in real life, those sponges of brads uh, are what we call uh, rain gardens or swales. How important are they in this general picture? Well, I think they're really significant. I think by building rain gardens and bioswales, you know, it sort of prevents those direct contaminants from going into streams and rivers. and so. You know, that's a benefit to everybody. Uh, if we have cleaner streams and cleaner rivers, um, you know, we have more fish and we have more uh, recreational activities. So, um, you know, that's a big part of it. 
And I think also there's the aesthetic part of it. I think, uh, you know, a while ago we used to call these retention ponds and they were like the forgotten landscape. And now we have rain gardens, we have bioswales, and these are really things that we uh, enjoy and we like to spend time in. Do you think they're spreading and is the awareness growing fast? Or what do you, what's the show going to look like in 10 years, do you think? Yeah, absolutely. I think the last five to 10 years, if that's any indication, I think we're going to see uh, you know, these things be really almost commonplace uh, as far as uh, from a landscape design aspect to a commercial building aspect. Uh, I think we're going to see rain harvesting you know, in general uh, be used as a common household word. word. What keeps you excited and, and, and revved up about this work? Um, I think the people, you know, the clients are really motivated. They really want to see something that's, uh, that they believe in, in a way, uh, that will help them. And, uh, you know, I think, again, going back to aesthetics, I think, you know, people want to see some nice things and they want to do something right for the environment as well. Mm. Ken Laidlaw, thank you very much for being with us on Immense Possibilities. Thank Appreciate you, Jeff. It. Let's take a closer graphic look at how rain gardens work. A rain garden is a shallow depression that contains a special soil mix rich in compost, as well as plants suitable for the wet winter conditions. The rain garden functions by the plants and the soils working together to both treat the pollution in stormwater and to process the quantity of stormwater by allowing it to soak back into the groundwater or by evapotranspiring it into the atmosphere. The runoff, which pours into the bay during our storms, contains pollution from our cars and our other activities. Those toxins are wreaking havoc with the plants and animals that depend on clean water. Those effects travel all the way up the food chain, from the salmon to the killer whales, and from the shellfish to the birds. You know, there's so many pollution situations where it's difficult to determine exactly what the problem is and to see how I could have any effect on it. But I can see the storm water running down into the storm drain and I can do my part to reduce the part of it that comes off my own property. When it rains, the water comes down the downspouts and it joins the rain falling on the driveway. That water used to go directly into the storm drains, but now I intercept it with this rain garden and I can use that water on my own plants. Another benefit of this whole area is that it turns out to be a potent hands-on way to help tune in kids about the environment and their ecosystems that they live in. One of the educators who does that is Rachel Whirling. Rachel is with the OSU Extension Service. Rachel, welcome. It's great to have you here. Thanks, Jeff. It's great with to us here. too is Sonora Jessup, who has uh, studied with Rachel and is a student at Willow Wind School in Ashland. Welcome. It's good to have you here, Sonora. It's great to be here. Rachel, how do you approach this whole area of teaching kids about what we're learning today about rainwater har harvest and its impact on the ecosystem? Well, I like to try and go at it um, in a really holistic way, starting with how the watershed and riparian areas, the stream areas kind of work together, and a lot of the natural functions that you've spoke about already on this program, where rain falls and it's filtered by the soils, the ground water table is recharged, and these are all natural functions in a natural watershed. When people move into a watershed, and build a town and live there, we have problems like wanting to live in dry houses, wanting to have dry streets to drive on, hard streets where we won't get stuck in our cars. So by solving these problems, we've discovered that we're causing other problems. And it's not just pollution from the urban environment and that running into the streams, but it's also the loss of all that water. When you will have 70% runoff, 50 to 70% runoff in an urban area compared to only 10% runoff in a natural watershed. Mm -hmm. So We'll talk about the problems with the pollution and the loss of all that water to the recharge in the water table. And then we'll introduce ideas of how one of the best things about people is how clever they are. So they're recognizing these problems and creating solutions. So there's this whole field of something called low impact development. And it's dealing with ways to handle storm water in a more ecologically friendly way. And rain gardens are part of that. Sonora, you're a student at Willow Wind, and you actually go outside as part of this class uh, to learn about how water moves, that kind of thing. Tell us about that. What, what's, what's been interesting about that? Many times we've gone outside and looked at where the water goes once it's like come off the roof. Mm -hmm. um, and at our school, it's different because it runs off of the roof into pipes, and then it goes into a bioswell. 
and then it gets sort of filtered and it runs into the creek. So that's instead of going off into a driveway and out into the street and down the storm gutter and into the creek with all those oils, you're actually kind of taking care of it on your own property. I wonder, I wonder if learning about all that has changed anything about what you think about water. Just, you know, we just opened the taps and there's all this water. Do you think about it any differently? Well, it made me realize that it's really important to conserve water. And from the moment I started learning about that, I started thinking about it in my everyday life and started conserving water a little bit more. What have you done that seems to really pique the interest of, of the kids? Well, I think the, what Sonora was describing is that we go out afterwards usually and examine their own school grounds and we see what they have there, where, where can the water soak in, where are the areas where they could actually make rain gardens themselves, where are the areas that are all pavement, where the pollution is coming up, what actually is the pollution that's on the parking lot. So they get a really hands-on example of that. And then we get them to brainstorm about if they had all the money and time in the world and they wanted to redesign it, what could they do? So hopefully they come up with ideas like bioswales and rain gardens. Can you think of an idea that uh, someone came up with that, that really caught your attention? Well, uh, different than the rain gardens, usually that does come up, the rain gardens, but they are all very fascinated with the idea of something called grass crete, which would be instead of black pavement, it would be a grass parking lot. I get that. What do you think, Rachel, is the immense possibility in the kind of education that you do? I think the most important thing about it, and water is a very useful tool for this, is getting kids to think in, uh, about systems in a large way and recognizing that they can be part of the solution, not feeling just a kind of despair or apathy about all the problems that they are going to face, but that they can really come up with ways to make things better. Rachel, thank you for doing that kind of work. Appreciate it very much. Thank you for being on Immense Possibilities with us. My pleasure. Sonora Jessup, thank you for spending some time with us today. I appreciate it very much. And we'll be right back with another story about the value of water. We have another of our semi-regular offerings from Journey of Action, the brother-sister team of Ryan and Cassidy Brown. They make short films on immense possibilities that the 20-something generation is bringing forward. And we just had a feeling, given their interest in a global environment that'll work for them and generations to come, that they would have a film on water. And they do. They explored an annual Navajo tradition in their film, Snowbathing with Black Fire. on the San Francisco Peaks, and we have been invited by Clayson to go snow bathing. And it's a tradition of yours uh, during the first snow of the year? This is actually something that we do from the time we're children. It's still kind of a spiritual uh, experience that, that we're undertaking. You know, it's challenging yourself, cleansing, purifying, and we want to make an offering to this mountain because you know, we, we don't ever just take anything from it, even though it's giving us so much, so we always make an offering to give back to the earth. So we're going to join Clayson in a prayer to the mountain. It's not appropriate to film, but we will continue filming once we bathe in the snow. To your breast, gonna put it to the test. You wanted it to be blessed. We live in uh, high, high desert altitude, and around these parts, you know, anytime you get moisture or precipitation, it's a blessing. So, you know, we always bless and honor and acknowledge the, the moisture that we've been gifted with. You know, the, the cold, all of those things, we build up a tolerance to it in, in our traditional way. It's part of the anajit, the hardening of the heart. So after this, they say, you know, after you bathe and wash in the first snow, you don't feel the cold. You actually become part of the environment. You become accustomed to it and tuned with it. So you work with it and it doesn't work against it. For all the loved ones gone Forever 
when I was a kid would make sure that I really rolled around and fully enjoyed it before I could come back in. <laughs> Here, maybe you should use this one, I'll trade you. A lot of what we feel, you know, like the cold, you know, if you imagine there are people out there that are homeless that survive through really intense temperatures and the comfort that we know, you know, all, all these things, a lot of it is mental. Yeah. You know, it's just a state of mind. You just learn to endure, become part of it. Surprisingly enough, my body is not too cold. It's mainly just my feet, really. Yeah, my extremity, yeah, my feet are like ice. Um, that's it, really. But it was an amazing experience to just let yourself go and just to believe in yourself that you just gotta go do it, you can do it. And once you got into it, it felt so good. <laughs> so right now, it's really just my feet. <laughs> Same way. I, well, I, I think for me, I saw you just jump in there and just kind of, you know, rubbed all over your body, so it's like, I saw you do it, and I was like, I gotta do it. Just earlier, we had all these jackets on while we were praying, and I was really cold. Now I'm sitting here with just a tank top on, and I'm not cold at all. We are in the special use permit area, the snow bowl. This area is one of the areas that they actually want to make artificial snow on with reclaimed wastewater. This will be part of their magic carpet run. Water from this mountain is very special, and, you know, the Obviously, this snow, you know, if the snowball has their way, you can't eat this, you know, this is... This is our water. I think that's all we've ever asked of people that come to enjoy and recreate here, is just to be respectful, to understand that, you know, there are cultures that hold sacred, that we don't need to, you know, try to extend the ski season by maybe one week or so, by we reclaim wastewater down. It's nice to get up here, actually, and see and see the picture ourselves and uh, experience the beauty. I feel good. Only, Only people out here. Never had an experience like this before. They haven't opened yet. Yeah. Sometime soon. That's it for tonight's edition of Immense Possibilities. We'll be back next week here on Southern Oregon Public Television. Until then, I'm Jeff Golden. Please do what you can do.